A gentle breeze over rolling emerald green hills, warm rays of sun tingling against soft cheeks, a ripple of energy swimming through the fabric of reality itself. The world changes, and yet, it stays the same. Mo Black, the bullshit hero, and the thoroughly exhausted protagonist of our never-ending tale, looks down. He pauses for a moment to look at his new set of clothes before glancing over at the busty and irate being that trapped him in this world. Guess we're doing a time skip now, Mo said. <sighs> what do you look so annoyed at, bullshit hero? growled Sakuna, the goddess of all isekai and perhaps fish? It's my realm, an entire genre of storytelling that's on the line here. She paused and shook her head. Though, I suppose the state of the world from which you were summoned isn't faring much better. The two exchanged a glance as time swells with silence. Mo looked away and squinted into the sun. Familiar in function and shape, yet foreign all the same to the light he'd known his entire life. When this moment of silent contemplation became unbearable, he shrugged. Well, it's been a while, right? In a weird, non-linear, temporal sort of sense. How about a recap, huh? The goddess agreed. A recap is certainly in order. Bullshit. A recap? Mo Black, the titular bullshit hero, was summoned by Sakuna, the goddess of Isekai itself, and given one simple purpose, to find the anime that has ruined Isekai for over a decade now and destroy it, such that Isekai may once again be good. While most fiction stories bring characters out from an environment that is familiar to them to one that is unfamiliar, Isekai consciously starts a protagonist in what the author perceives as the real world before moving them somewhere else. This self-awareness of the real world allows Isekai to make statements about contemporary life in a way other genres can't. Sword Art Online, one of the first Isekai to reach popularity the genre is associated with, is often blamed for having ruined the genre, however, upon inspection, the hate it receives seemed largely overblown, and the story itself didn't quite fit the mold for modern Isekai as one may remember. Comedy parodies like Konosuba and Cautious Hero attempt to criticize Isekai, but end up repeating the same tropes with a thin, ironic layer added on. Regardless of their own shittiness, these anime were clearly a response to other shitty Isekai and could not be the source of the shitty isekai ness themselves. Which left the hero and the goddess with one question, how next to find the anime that ruined Isekai and save it from its assured destruction? <sighs> and that leaves us... To this moment, let's talk about some motherfucking isekai. Chapter 4 Bullshit. What about isekai with female protagonists? We have dealt with a lot of sexist anime lately. That we have, replied the hero. So why not turn our attention to the recent isekai with female protagonists? Female-focused isekai have been a new trend lately in anime. Less new in light novels or manga. Anyway, if we can find out what they're reacting to, maybe we can pin down the shows that are causing 12d6 metaphysical damage to the entire genre. I... Did you just make a TTRPG joke? You, you never make TTRPG jokes. Okay, but that's bottom tier of tabletop RPG references, Mo replied. Besides, we're post time skip. Anything's possible now. Sakuna rolled her eyes. Whatever. Anyway, I object to your implication that isekai with female protagonists are anything new. Before Sword Art Online, Inuyasha was a staple of the genre. Plus, shoujo isekai have existed as light novels, web novels, and manga this entire time. It's more accurate to say that capitalists have begun to realize that women also buy things, so the other half of the entire human population can indeed be converted to capital off the backs of non-male LGBT authors in the same way it can off the books of male authors. Mo nodded. That's a good point. 
we'll need to give this recent trend a name that separates it from the women that have existed in this genre the whole time, just unfairly cast aside. How about... Don't give it an overly complicated, pretentious name. How about... Got it. Neoclassical female focus isekai. Mo, Mo, I fucking hate you. There have been three of these kinds of shows that have gained a lot of traction lately. Didn't I say to make my abilities average in the next life, the ascendance of a bookworm, and my next life as a villainess, all routes lead to doom. You need water after reading those titles? You know, after seeing ReZero Season 2, I don't exactly trust goddesses and fluids. How dare you say such a foul thing about me? Electricity crackled at her fingertips, but the goddess mustered the strength needed to regain her composure. Ugh, re regardless, analyzing any one of these shows will probably bring us closer to my goal, so take your pick. How about Bookworm? With a flick of her wrist, a small glowing orb broke off from the summoning seed and floated in front of Mo. The goddess commanded it to display a sentence of a bookworm for criticism. Mo slowly backed away from the glowing sphere. You know what? Why don't we... Just... Pass on this one? Read my mind. How about average abilities? It mostly follows the male chauvinist isekai formula, but it swaps out a male protagonist for a young girl. It's even self-aware like Hashi's hero was. Mo beamed. Oh yeah, we can have some good continuity from the last volume. Sakuna grinned. All you care about is making a good essay. All I care about is saving my realm. Together, with the help of incredible amounts of coercion, our interests align to create something truly magical. Lucky us. Didn't I say to make my abilities average in the next life? Which I will henceforth be abbreviating as this maintenance instead of the more sensical average abilities. Ugh, so annoying. Is, in addition to being an isekai, a cute girls doing things show. And so we're gonna have to go on a little bit of a detour here and interrogate that before getting into the anime itself. Cute Girls Doing Things this is a general name the anime community has settled on for shows that revolve around the interactions of incredibly cute middle and high school age girls. I wouldn't really describe this as a genre personally, but a super genre? These shows rarely have similarities in setting or plot. Any other genre can also be cute girls doing things. Generally, if we're looking at a show whose main cast is filled with three to six girls who see the ages of 11 and 17, who all have very pale and pretty skin, who all have strong but sometimes tropey personalities, who all share an incredibly obvious yet somehow never acknowledged by the narrative homoerotic subtext, and who exist in a world where every passerby, every teacher, every business owner, every traveler is somehow female, you're probably looking at a cute girls doing things show. If you're watching a show where what happens in the story feels secondary to just watching these girls interact around whatever wacky thing the situation has pushed them to do, you are definitely watching cute girls doing things show. If you want to see this idea at its most distilled and cynical, the fall 2020 anime Dropout Idol Fruit Tart is a decent case study on the kinds of tropes that build the experience you're getting with cute girls doing things. If you want to instead see this idea done well, <laughs> I would instead direct you to k which I haven't watched yet, but I've heard nothing but good things about. As a coincidence, k came out around the same time as Sword Art Online and has pretty much had as much of an impact on cute girls doing things as SAO had on Isekai. The early 2010s really were a time. <laughs> now I'm wondering how this would have turned out if I was summoned by the goddess of cute girls doing things instead. Oh, you mean Kani? Sakuna asked with a raised eyebrow. Wait, that's a thing? Mo stared at the isekai goddess, hoping she'd pull out her characteristic scowl and scold him for being gullible, but she seemed serious. What's Kani like? Sakuna put a finger on her chin, then shrugged. Well... She's a cute 
girl. The reason why this is relevant to dismate no, it's dismate. Why did I do this to myself? Why did I write this? I knew I had to voice it. Why did I write dismate no? The reason why this is relevant to dismate no, so relevant that I've described cute girls doing things before even describing dismate no's plot, is that cute girls doing things is usually aimed at men. I of course add a disclaimer that not every cute girls doing things are made for men. A lot of them are also Yuri, which are frequently written by women and aimed at lesbians and other LGBT people. But a good tranche of these shows are men showing off cute and sexy girls to other men. This is a little hard to pick up on, especially as a Western anime fan, because cute girls doing things as a super genre relies more on look and feel than anything else. And the closest thing we have in the West to something that looks and feels like cute girls doing things are like Barbie shows and other animation aimed at young girls. Something like, say, uh, DC Superhero Girls. I promise this is going somewhere. But this is a prime example of convergent evolution, where two things with similar traits got to where they are from entirely different circumstances and intentions. Western cartoons for girls started out as a ploy to sell dolls to girls. Then over time, the writers wanted to actually make meaningful stories for their audiences. Female characters got fleshed out. The genre went through a spell in the early 2000s with shows like Kim Possible and Totally Spies that took masculine action hero tropes and superimposed on valley girl stereotypes and other female quoted tropes. Actually, Totally Spies I would probably count as an anime. I wonder if- Nope, not doing that. Snap Sakuna. Alright, alright, I, I promise, I'm almost done. Eventually, with the uh, dialectic around toxic masculinity reaching its apex, a lot of these girl cartoons strove for balance, where the girls do cute feminine things, but they also tend to be powerful heroes with magic powers who don't need men to save them. There's a definite girl-boss vibe in the genre that tries to tie femininity with strength, intelligence, and independence. And that's where the cuteness comes in. Cute girls doing things anime, on the other hand, has an entirely different history. It actually comes, in some ways, but not all, from idol culture. And the prominent target audience for idols are not girls the same age as the idols, but middle-aged men. Idol culture is presented as a relief for men crushed under capitalist alienation. If you're a straight man and you spend 50 to 60 hours a week in a job you hate, and doesn't pay enough, surrounded by other men, if you're also forced, as many Japanese workers are, to attend after-work socials with those same people and holiday parties and vacations and so on, you don't get time for yourself or for dating or even a sex life. Idol culture presents itself as the solution to this problem. Instead of actually meeting people, which is impossible for you, you can just watch these overly saturated and incredibly sexualized young girls dance and sing and do silly things and touch each other. It is an incredibly predatory cycle of abuse and exploitation of children that usually ends in death threats when the idols commit mortal sins like dating people their own age or not keeping up their hyper-feminine performances at every waking second of every minute of every day. And it is from this culture that cute girls doing things derives its purpose. Anime allows for this same function of providing men with feminine release and perfects it with idealized and fantastical settings. This is why, although a western girls cartoon and an anime may feel similarly cute and feminine, your average Barbie show will probably never have jiggle physics or feature the main characters groping each other while the same cannot be said for seemingly analogous anime. This mate null can be partially understood as idols but isekai. But it gets more complicated than that. The vast majority of cute girls doing things aesthetic actually has nothing to do with the writing and everything to do with the camera and the character design. This means that a light novel that was in no way, shape, or form cute girls doing things and instead featured a female cast can become cute girls doing things with the right director and production lead, which can lead to situations where women write stories for women, but then they become male-oriented stories through the process of adaptation. I feel really bad for simplifying cute girls doing things to this degree. There's way more to it than that, and again, the entire thing isn't just for dudes. 
but this side of it is the side that's relevant for my point, so it's the side I'm taking the time to explain. This mate null is the story of a high schooler and teenage girl named Misato Kurihara. That's right. It's embarrassing, but I'm one of those reincarnated into another world people. In her life, she was unable to make friends because she was such a high achiever. So, when she dies after being run over by a truck, it came for me! The famous reincarnated into another world out of control truck! She tells God that in her next life, she wants to be reincarnated as a completely average girl so she can make herself some friends. And so she's reincarnated into a world that follows Clark's third law. The world is covered in nanomachines that respond to human thought and technology so advanced that the world regressed back again into medieval fantasy with knights and sorcerers. Despite her request, Misato is reborn as the daughter of nobles, Adelaide von Ashram. She makes some friends and some enemies before she realizes she has a problem. She's actually much more gifted in magical ability than everyone else around her. It turned out that when God sent Misato down to this new world, he made her as strong as the mean power of all the creatures in the world. But since the This can't be real! There's no way! Magic power so strong you can see it? Pardon the interruption, but I can explain! That which is considered to be magic occurs when we nanomachines take spellcasters' thought waves, or what is commonly referred to as magical power, and cause various phenomena. When we compare Miles' thought waves to the other spellcasters of this world, they're 6,800 times stronger! That's why she can use magic without a spell, and why her physical abilities are so impressive. But Mile asked for her abilities to be average, didn't she? So what's the deal? Listen up, because the explanation is a little tricky. Among all the creatures in this world, there's one that's clearly considered the strongest. That creature would be the Elder Dragon. So you see, Mile's power is the average of the weakest creature and the strongest. Using that logic, she gained half the power of the Elder Dragon. You can sort out the rest, right? There are many more weak creatures than strong one, Adelaide ended up several times stronger than the median power level of her surroundings, which is what she was really aiming for. When her powers are revealed, Adelaide is eventually forced to renounce this identity and take up her new name, Mile. She then moves to the big city at the age of 12, forms a party with three other girls, Mavis von Ashtin, age 17, Pauline, age 14, and Reina, age 15. Now united, the four of them go on adventures, earning enough money to not go houseless or hungry, and uncovering the secrets of the world they found themselves in. Miles slowly learns that she doesn't really have to be average to make friends, she just needs to be willing to reach out to those she cares about. So between the last draft I was reincarnated into and this one, I took the time to look at this mate Null's light novel chapters in manga. I'm sorry, between what reincarnation? Mopaz, suddenly remembering the very painful consequences about spilling the truth of return by draft. Forget I said anything. Point is, there are a lot of changes and additions between the anime and the light novels, especially towards the beginning. Well, of course. If we're being honest, the light novels are quite naive and amateur. They start where your summary starts, at the beginning when Misato dies. They spend over 20 chapters on dealing with Adelaide's life in painful detail before finally having mine meet her friends and starting the bulk of the story. Starting with overly detailed irrelevant nonsense before finally getting to the point? I guess it's a lot like your writing, Mo. Wow, you're really gonna say that in front of my 500 YouTube subscribers? Yes. But it is a property that follows its source material much more loosely than other isekai, and given that this is a cute girls doing things show, we need to be extra aware of how the studio actually handled this property. The anime starts just when Mile is moving to the city, while the manga starts in Adelaide's last few days before becoming Mile. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Yes, I can see how this would be useful in my goal. Plus, it could give some insight into how anime studios keep making isekai that make me wish I weren't immortal. So this is a weird place to start, but I promise it'll make sense soon. Mile has a boob complex in the anime, but not in the manga or the light novels. 
That's a weird thing to add in. Okay, well, a lot of girls in anime have boob complexes, so that in and of itself isn't unusual. It's a little bit concerning to give a 12 year old a boob complex. So when I was 12, I was playing Pokemon Platinum outside on my DS. I had a crush on a little um, brunette in my science class, and the most I ever wanted to do with her was hold her hand, because what else would a 12 year old even be doing? I was on the swings one day at recess and she talked to me and I was so nervous I ended up not being much of a conversation. She kind of just left a little hurt and that was the end of that. Anyway, if I was worried at age 12 that my dick wasn't big enough to pleasure her, that would probably be a bad thing. So maybe Mila's not the right character for this specific trope on account of being 12 years old. But the other thing that's weird is that it doesn't work for Miles' character. In the source material, one of the things that Adelaide found frustrating about being reincarnated, besides having incredible magical ability, was that she was also very pretty. She got non-stop attention from boys at her school and jealousy from the girls, when what she really wanted was to be average. When she becomes Mile, Reyna has to actually tell Mile not to date the dozens of men who will be hitting on her asking for marriage because she's pretty and incredibly strong. If having a flat chest means she doesn't get as much attention, that's actually good for Mile. That's what she wants. And the source material treats her like it. If there's anyone who wishes they had a larger chest in the source material, it's Reyna. Aside from being 15, like the age where a teenager might have these kinds of insecurities, her backstory of having had her parents killed by raiders also means she's in a hurry to grow up. She wants to be a tall, curvy, and powerful adult magic user who strikes fear into the hearts of her enemies, but instead she's stuck in the frail body of a child at age 15. It makes more sense for her than to be a little jealous of Pauline, who despite being a year younger than her, is both taller and more well endowed. And even then, it's not an obnoxiously recurring gag character trait like it is for Mile in the anime. In the anime, this flat chest stuff is just a gag. And it's a gag you've seen in anime a hundred times, so you don't exactly notice it other than it being annoying and gross, if you only watch the anime. But if you check out the source material, suddenly you realize that, for no reason, character-focused storytelling was swapped out and replaced with shitty tropes. The light novels weren't all that well organized at the start, but they did have a solid sense of what mattered to them and the writing greatly improved as its hundreds of chapters marched on. That's the thing about amateur writers. You can fix organizational stuff with experience, but having an eye for your characters and caring about them is something you either do or don't. And this mate no author does it. Since you brought it up, there's another change worth noting. The scene in the manga where we learn Reyna wants to grow up is a scene where Mile tells her new teammates stories to entertain them. In the manga, these stories are specific to each character, and they reveal what these characters want the most. Reyna, as you said, wants to grow up and be strong. Mavis wants to be a real heroic knight like in the folktales and fall in love with a princess. She's confirmed gay in the manga, while this is kept ambiguous in the anime. And Pauline is a capitalist, so she's evil. But in the anime, these stories are switched out for video game references? We don't actually learn about the characters in the scene. The anime just pats you on the back for being an otaku and they go to hunter school the next day tired because Miles stayed up all night making JRPG references. Speaking of capitalism, there are also class issues that the anime drops but are present in the light novel. The light novels aren't socialist or anything, but they make a point to remember that because Miles was born an aristocrat, She's actually much richer than her peers. The hunter school she transfers to, to meet Pauline, Mavis, and Reyna, has a financial aid program. Students that can't afford it get free meals and housing. Mile makes an active effort to hide the fact that she could easily afford to eat out and blend in with her friends, who are dirt poor and have to eat every meal at school. The anime mentions tuition being free, but this specific nuance is entirely lost. But Mo, I think you're missing the biggest change between the source material and the anime. But do we have to? I, I think I made my point pretty well. Obviously! Sakuna shook her head. 
You already ran from Bookworm. Do you want this to be a good essay or not? Okay, fine, I get it. The anime follows more or less from the events of the manga in terms of Mile, Pauline, Mavis, and Regina's graduation into their party, the Crimson Vow. However, the anime introduces a villain to tie these events together instead of just having them happen one at a time. This isn't an inherently bad idea. However, the villain ends up being a pedophile noble who grooms children. This woman takes an interest in Mile because her chest is still flat. And it plays the whole thing for laughs. Now, one could argue that, at least in this case, the villain is at least framed as a villain and goes to jail for her crimes. But this is not enough to save the scene, in this case just because of the other banality with which the subject matter is approached. It's disgusting. Imagine if this pedophile had instead been a man. Would the Average Abilities team have felt so confident in treating the subject the way they did? Would they have even gone with the idea in this case? It's hard to imagine things would have played out the same, especially with the sexist double standards of male and female abusers present in much of your world today. The first time I watched this show, I had completely missed this point. It, it took an anime feminist article, actually, to make me factor this analysis into my argument. I guess for uh, people who think I'm perfect and sniff out sexism in anime first time like a legend, you shouldn't be afraid to let people call you out when you miss something. I think it's clear that the anime industry itself had a serious hand in misshaping average abilities. Wouldn't it help to learn who was behind the decisions of the anime? Mo nodded. Now, let's see here. He used some of his own power to open a web browser in the middle of the air. The internet is surprisingly good here. Thank you. Okay, Wikipedia time. Masahiko Ota, huh? What else has he worked on? So, a lot of cute girls doing things, actually. Like Yuru Yuri, Love Lab, and Gabriel Dropout and some cute girls doing things adjacent to anime, like Umaru-chan. The fact that they brought him on means they made a conscious decision with how they wanted this mate null adapted. Is that...? Most squinted. Uchi no Maid? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uchi no Maid ga Uzasugiru, or My Maid is So Annoying, is an anime about a pedophile and former Air Force pilot who signs up to be a maid for one of her neighbors after noticing her neighbors have a cute Russian daughter. The maid specifically fetishizes the girl's white skin and blonde hair and openly states she's, quote, not attracted to women who have begun to menstruate, unquote. Despite the child desperately trying to inform her father, that her maid is constantly harassing her, taking her underwear, and in general trying to touch her in ways that she doesn't want, the father refuses to listen. The story, for 12 excruciating episodes, is just this poor child defending herself from being abused while the narrative frames it as a joke. I've watched a few episodes of this, and from Waddington, an angel flew down to me, basically the same premise but replaces Air Force pilot with Bussy Otaku, college student, and Russian child with her sister's kindergarten friend, and you've got it. Because I, at one point, wanted to do an essay on pedophile anime and Lolicon in general, but I couldn't sit through it. I am the bullshit hero, I can handle a lot of bullshit, but that was, that was a little much, even for me. Someone else can write it though, I'd be happy to read it over for you, it's, it's just not my fight. The point is not to launch some kind of moralistic crusade against Masahiko Ota. He directed an anime I don't like. Big deal. There are so, so many other people behind the decision to actually produce this anime in the first place. The point is that if we talk about Isekai, my realm, getting worse, more cliched, more sexist, and more, well, creepy, we need to understand the full extent to which the machine of capital makes sure that these kind of isekai are what get made. I'm pretty sure there's a great podcast episode about manufacturing cons- Ow! 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 Don't plug other things in your isekai essay, you sellout. Sellout to who? To myself? Ah. Ah, fuck that hurts. The point here is that the Average Abilities Production Committee took what could have been, if adapted well, a refreshing and potentially subversive isekai written by a woman, probably based on the source material's pen name, 
and made instead more conformist garbage that cares more about Dragon Ball Z and Legend of the Galactic Heroes references than its own damn story. The anime feels like same old same old written by creepy men for creepy men when this really, given what was originally published, should not have been the case. What was with the Legend of the Galactic Heroes references anyway? No idea. LOGH is cool though. Sakuna rolled her eyes. It's... it's neat. I think what's amazing about Average Abilities, however, is that signs of what the show could have been still shine through despite how relentlessly capitalist botched its execution. While Mile, like Seiya and Kirito before her, is overpowered, the power fantasy and obnoxious need to be stronger than everybody else in existence is thankfully missing. The Crimson Vow as a team is also non-hierarchical. There isn't a leader that the others sing their praises about or follow around. Pauline is good at finances, so she handles the team's budget. Reyna is driven and focused, so she picks the quest the team goes on and sees them to through to completion. Mile has incredible magic power, a wild imagination from her previous life as an otaku, and a ton of scientific knowledge from her previous life as a super genius. So she provides the training and skills needed to put the group on top. And Mavis? I mean, she's got the style. What else would you ask from her? We can't exactly call it good representation, in part because it'd be hard to say what's being represented here, but Mavis being allowed to simply exist as androgynous or even masculine at times and being celebrated for that is appreciated, especially considering how male-focused isekai tend to treat, say, male characters that are extremely feminine with hostility, homophobia, and a refusal to acknowledge that these characters are valid in their identities beyond a shameful fetish. If you watch past the boob jokes and the actual pedophilia, you'll begin to experience the anime we should have gotten instead of this one. And that's a shame, because one shouldn't have to say, just watch past the pedophilia and it'll be good. That's nonsense. Average Abilities is, therefore, just not a good anime, really. And since the light novels were not particularly well written either due to the author's lack of experience, it's an incredible shame that this story will never be done justice, under my watch of all things. The manga is perhaps the most salvageable version of this story, but it's really behind. Mo nodded. That tracks onto my experiences with the anime. I rolled my eyes and mocked all the references and the haha look how self-aware I am humor in the first few episodes because I knew this maintenance wasn't actually challenging those tropes at all. But. I fell in love with this show after episode 4 or 5. At first I thought it was because it just gets better, but upon interrogation, 4 and 5 are just when the production committee stops fucking up the narrative so hard and starts letting the story that actually exists here breathe. None of the creative energy, except for maybe the color design and animation direction, actually went to anything good. Sakana paused. Say, Mo, what if there was an isekai that was very similar to Average Abilities, that basically had the same premise, but again featured a male protagonist? What would you think then? Well, I'd say I'd have to watch that too, if nothing else, to identify the types of tropes that would be reintroduced into a show like this Maynol if the female focus element was removed. Ha <laughs> ha ha. Luckily for me, you don't have such a convenient anime for me, and we can move on. Right? R right, goddess? Why are you looking at me like that? The Eighth Son, are you kidding me, shares many, many similarities with this Mino. A protagonist is reincarnated to a fantasy world as a small child. This child lives a period of life in a noble family before realizing they have extraordinary magic abilities. The child moves to a big city at the age of 13 instead of 12 to enroll in a hunter school. The child is bad at making friends, but stumbles upon, by chance, three working class kids who the child forms close friendship with. The four graduate together and form a party before going on adventures together. 
The principal difference between the Eighth Son and the Smaynol, really, is the gender of the protagonist. Mile is a girl, while the Eighth Son's Wendelin von Benno Baumeister is a boy. I'm not going to let you go without pointing out how absolutely awful everyone's name in this anime are. Look at this, it's always bad fake German names too. Elise Katharina von Hohenheim Johann Jolande Aurelia Overweg Katharina Linda von Weigel Amadeus Freitag von Bleich Maria von Benno Erwin Baumeister von Scott Hart Theodorisch Philipp von Phil Half of these fantasy tropes are based on medieval English folklore and the rest of the tropes probably come from France. Why German? Why literally never any other language? It's infuriating. It's fine when Legend of the Galactic Heroes does it, though. Well, it made sense there. That story has a Nazi parallel. The Eighth Sun is a truly empty piece of work. What's worse is that it lies to you. Before being reincarnated, Wendelin is instead a middle-aged businessman named Ichinomiya Shingo who, like all workers, suffers from capitalist alienation. He wishes to be reborn in a world where he's free from the shackles of poverty, coerced labor, and aging. After falling asleep during dinner one night, he seems to get his wish. He's reincarnated as the six-year-old Wendelin von Benno Baumeister, surrounded by luxury food and important people. Finally, he could live his dream of a life of relaxation where no one could tell him what to do. Well, not quite. The next day, Wendelin discovers that his noble family is actually extremely poor. And not only that, but Wendelin is the eighth son of said noble family, so he'll probably inherit nothing. Brother Walter and Brother Carl? Which means we're poor nobles, and in terms of an inheritance, I'm the eighth son? Are you kidding me? His family may have the legal authority to make decisions in his domain, but Wendelin himself will live life similarly to a peasant. Refusing to let this be his fate, Wendelin searches for a way he can lift himself out of poverty. To keep a long story short, he finds a test in his new family's home for a magical aptitude and realizes he's mysteriously more powerful than most people in history. He gets trained by the spirit of another legendary mage, escapes his family, and travels on to become an adventurer. He meets his party members, Aaron von Arnim, Ina Susanne Hirenbrandt, and Louise Yolanda Aurelia Ophelbeck. They're all the youngest siblings in their families, like Wendelin, and so the four of them bond over having something to prove to the world that, I guess, being a younger sibling isn't that bad? I don't... The show acts like this is a coherent theme, but it's not. One would expect, therefore, from the Eighth Son, similar party dynamics to Dismanal, but that simply isn't the case. And the main reason why is that none of the other characters have arcs. See, even though Mile is overpowered, her teammates are still allowed space in the narrative to have their own struggles. Mavis struggles with her family, Reyna struggles with her past, Pauline has their own moments as well. In fact, Mile's personal struggle of making friends is started in the first episode and basically gets put on hold until the end so that the rest of the cast can have time to shine. The Eighth Son is deeply allergic to any such consideration. The two girls, Louise and Ina, their entire arc is asking Wendelin if they can be his concubines. That's it. That's the story. It consists of them asking to be his concubine and his 12-year-old wife saying that's fine and normal. Oh, I didn't mention Wendelin's wife. Okay, basically, Wendelin gets an arranged marriage with this priest named Elise Katharina von Hohenheim and she ends up joining the party too. This is her introduction shot. So there's that. Erwin is exactly analogous to Mavis actually. He, like her, is a swordsman slash swordswoman for Mavis with no magical ability who just trains very hard to have the physical ability to be useful to the party. Erwin worries that Wendelin might not have need for him if he's too weak, so Wendelin hires him as his personal servant and he revels in the fact that his master has given him a job. 
As for Wendelin himself, he slays a dragon around episode 4, gets promoted in his noble rank, gets a ton of money and woman, and still somehow complains that this is a bad thing actually because so many people are just jealous of his hard work and success. I shit you not, every antagonist in this show is just some man who's jealous of Wendelin. Principally, the change in gender for this story turns what was in Dismatenal, a non-hierarchical friend group, into an extremely hierarchical pecking order in the Eighth Sun. There's a head male, a Chad, if you will, who has all the money and power. As a man, your role is to work under him and graciously serve his every need and prove your worth through hard work such that Chad may share some of his spoils with you. And if you're a woman, just slot yourself into Chad's harem. You better be conventionally attractive, and you better work to keep Chad happy, otherwise he'll drop you for a more attractive girl. With this view of hierarchy in mind, Wendelin's endless complaining about how, even though he's escaped life as an office worker, he still has work and obligations as a noble is rather frustrating. If we establish in Volume 1 that Isekai seeks to critique the world by comparing it to a fictional one, the Eighth Son has a piss poor critique of the world. It complains about capitalism and hierarchy that exists in our world, and then flees to another world to reproduce those same injustices, seemingly unaware that it can choose to stop being garbage at any time. We ought to examine the source material for the Eighth Sun as well as how it was changed in adaptation, said the goddess. Alright. Unlike Average Ability's adaptation, which overwhelmingly added regressive elements to a story that was not there in the first place, the Eighth Sons team seems to have attempted, in vain, to make the story more workable. We can say the most jarring example of this is Wendelin's attraction to his child peers. In the anime, the issue is simply not brought up. Wendelin may have started out as a 25-year-old man, but he's a child now so his partners are also children. It almost just gets away with not asking the question of why a grown man would fantasize about being a child again so he can sleep with children, but there's enough ambiguity to read the best possible interpretation into the text. In the manga, Wendelin openly states that he's not a lolicon. The story makes it explicit that he still has the mind of his pre-reincarnation self, at this point over 30 years old, and so isn't attracted to his peers. That is, of course, until his marriage with a 12-year-old bride who Wendelin is openly attracted to and who the narrative gleefully sexualizes. The light novels go a step further. Instead of claiming not to be attracted to children, Wendelin instead explains that when he was an adult, he thought he wasn't attracted to children, but it's been six years since he touched a woman that wasn't his isekai mom, and now kids are starting to look pretty tempting, actually. This is a rough translation because it's an unofficial translation of the light novel, but it'll do for now. I had thought that I had no interest in lollies, just like in my previous life, but when Louise asked me while smiling, I can't say anything. Is it because, for many years, other than mother and sister-in-law, I hardly talked with women that I am biased? Nah, I also had a girlfriend before in my previous life. I don't have a fear of strangers or gynophobia. But I didn't meet that many people in these last six years, so by chance, maybe I developed a lollicon complex. There is clearly a sanitization effect taking place. Some executive decided that adapting this story would net a profit, but then the people who read the source material realized it was horrifying and tried to fix it by just forgetting this stuff exists. Oh, but I remember. I always remember. Although it would be rude to keep staring at her, there was no one in the same generation like Ina who could win against those two hills. The originally inconspicuous nun's habit was pushed up by her breast portion. While there existed such things as 11-year-old Gravier idols with f cuffs in my previous life, there are many people in this world who resemble Europeans and Americans in shape and appearance. Therefore, it might not be too strange for an approximately 12-year-old girl with above f-cups to exist here. There is no contradiction between the themes of disliking corporate hierarchy and the hierarchy of Wendelin's party in the light novels as there are in the anime, because, well, the light novels just love hierarchy straight up and make no attempts to do anything else. The most important change between the anime and its source material is the ending of the first season. In the anime, Wendelin has a conflict with his older brother Kurt. He doesn't want to kill him, 
but Kurt ends up dying by the end and Wendelin replaces him as the heir to his family. The season ends with Wendelin resuming his role as an office worker from his past life, this time overseeing the development of his noble territory. In the source material, things are more or less the same, only Wendelin kills his brother and sleeps with his brother's wife. From then on, Wendelin collects over a dozen wives, many of whom are his own family. There isn't a single prominent female character who doesn't just end up sleeping with Wendelin or marrying him. No amount of trimming around the edges can fix a story as fundamentally sexist as the Eighth Son, are you kidding me? Since the majority of isekai anime are adaptations of source material, studio meddling, executive interference, and capitalist pressure are so much more influential than what people tend to imagine. Especially given the fact that most weebs seem to think that the point of an anime adaptation is to adapt a book they've already read word for word, scene for scene. Do you remember SAO? Sakuna's upper lip curled up in annoyance. D do I remember? You're asking me, the goddess of all isekai, if I remember Sword Art Online, a story which, diegetically, we just finished talking about not even an hour or two ago? Just queuing up the next side tangent. Don't be rude. So in the second quarter of Sword Art Online, there's a whole subplot where protagonist Kazuto's stepsister and very not step-cousin Suguha falls in love with him. And it's a whole thing. It's a whole drama. In fact, it's the central drama for the season. Textually, the arc ends with Sugaha getting over her attraction to her brother, realizing that it's unhealthy, and choosing to start a new era where she and her brother are best friends that support each other. But visually, especially when she's in the game, she, like, looks like this, right? And also this. Suguha and her in-game counterpart, Lifa, are by far the most sexualized SEO character. Just ever. There's no other character that competes. And the more you stray away from the source material and the main anime into the spin-offs and the games, the more sexualized she becomes. She she's tits on legs, basically. And I cannot stress how ass this is. I cannot overemphasize how terrible of a narrative decision this is. It's so bad. You know why? Because, again, textually, that is, ignoring everything happening on screen and just reading the dialogue, SAO is a story that quite earnestly subverts and deconstructs a really common but toxic anime trope, the whole my sibling is in love with me thing. It argues that this would actually be a really bad thing in real life. It encourages Kazuto to return to a healthy relationship with his wife Asuna, and, by not giving Sukuha any other love interests, argues that she doesn't really need to be in love anymore to find happiness. But subtextually, that is, now including how the camera actually treats her, all of that goes out the window. All the stuff about how a brother-sister relationship would actually be super unhealthy in real life no longer holds weight because the camera is basically constantly wiggling its eyebrows at you and suggestively saying, Hey, hey, wouldn't it be rad if you had a sexy little sister you could fuck? No, actually. No, it would not. I hate it here. And for the longest time, I didn't really know what to do with this. People have, rightfully, complained that SAO is pro-incest. It's what an online isekai? Um... I don't know. I don't like this anime. I like it. I don't like incest. I don't care. And in Volume 1, I more or less filed this under SAO has problems with how the camera treats its female characters. I didn't know what to do with what I felt was a pretty huge gap between what was written and what the director of the anime decided to do. As it turns out though, Suguha isn't like this in the source material. In the original book, she had like a slimmer body type and a lot less fan service. Suguha never had a snowball's chance in hell to compete with Asuna for Kazuto's affection. The story is indeed just about Suguha getting over the toxic feeling she has for her brother. It turns out that when SAO was adapted from the web novel to other mediums, publishers and executives thought it would be better if the story had a fanservice character, and Suguha, being the little sister figure in love with her brother, was perfect for that. They recommended they up her cup size a bit and give her a more showy outfit, and author Kawahara Reki agreed. So to recap, we threw away what could have been one of the most subversive and deconstructive arcs in the whole genre because some dude in a suit somewhere thought this was more important. Was it though? Was it worth it? And I guess that's my point here. 
Whether it's altering this mate null to fit into the same male-centric archetypical boxes we've seen a million times, or choosing to adapt a story like Eighth Son at all and trying to tape on a deeper meaning in the adaptation, or butchering entire characters at the altar of fan service like SAO does, was it worth it? Did these decisions, which were made entirely with the hope of generating profit, create better, more meaningful, more fulfilling stories? There are three main conclusions to take away from this exercise in brain rot. First, though the return of female protagonists to the forefront of isekai is indeed cause for celebration, simply having a female protagonist isn't going to fix the genre. Likewise, the genre isn't broken because of its male protagonist, it's broken because of a sexist and classist ideology that pervades the genre. Non-men writing non-male characters are more likely to write outside of this ideology than men writing male characters. But that does not mean there's something essential about masculinity that makes isekai bad, or something essential about femininity that will fix it. Second, while it's possible to make a good story reactionary by cutting and reframing scenes here and there, you can't fix a story that's fundamentally broken by trimming and cutting. If you're going to adapt an isekai that has structural issues with the way it handles gender, you have to rewrite the whole story. You can't just cut out the worst scenes and keep the rest. You won't fool anyone. At least you won't fool me. Finally, and I really can't believe I have to say this, but less pedophilia, maybe. Like, less of an open desire to want to have sex with children in anime. Children cannot consent to sex. We shouldn't normalize a culture that pretends otherwise. I'm not even saying never have fan service or big boobs in anime ever again. I'm not saying lock up everyone who self-publishes a web novel with lolly shit in it. I don't want to enforce anime standards TM that the state can use to bust down your door if you don't comply. I'm literally just saying, if you're a capitalist and one of your employees comes up to you and says, Sir, that light novel you want to adapt into an anime, it's got several pages of the main character fantasizing about 11-year-old Gravier idols with F-cups. Maybe step back and go, oh shit, my bad. It's probably not worth making people work on this then. The harm I'm doing to society isn't worth the profit. Or, barring that, it's not even going to make a ton of money or be popular, so why shouldn't bother? Well, uh, about that. The goddess said, her eyes bored into the ground. What? It's got like a 6.20 on Mal. No one likes this show. No one likes it now, but see... <sighs> it was the most popular show on Crunchyroll for the first half of Spring 2020. People only started dropping it when they realized it was skimping out on the action scenes, had next to no fan service, and was cutting content all around. You're... You're kidding, right? Well, the first few episodes are perhaps the best the series has to offer. And with the context they added about being a corporate slave, one could conceivably imagine that the anime would finally offer something different to my genre's decline. But it becomes obvious that this is not the case soon enough. Mo narrowed his eyes. Are you okay, goddess? You seem a bit on edge. On edge isn't even the half of it. The air began to smell of ozone as clouds obscured the sky. <sighs> How do I explain this in a way you'll understand? You humans. Many of you have needs, correct? Like, romantic and intimate needs? It's pretty common among humans, sure. Well, I don't have that. I do have, however, a bottomless desire to destroy anime that piss me off. I don't like the face you're making. You got me there, I guess, said the bullshit hero with a shrug. You know, I can sort of rationalize sparing SAO. And passing on destroying Konosuba and Kashi's hero was my idea, certainly. But next you're gonna tell me we can't blow up the 8th sun either, because it's really just a product of all the forces that we've talked about so far, and just another symptom of the problem? A mo blanks. But that's good though, right? Not if you want to blow stuff up, Mo. The goddess paced frantically back and forth, her pale skin becoming more and more flushed as she did. <sighs> I know what I'll do. She said finally with a sadistic smile on her face. I'll drudge out the worst isekai ever made in recent memory. A show so terrible, so devoid of merit, that no one even for an instant thought it was good. A show so thoroughly despised that destroying it can do nothing but good for isekai as a genre. <laughs> yes, it's clear to me now. I know just the anime that will satisfy my needs. Wait, let's talk about this rationally here. Shut up. For the next chapter, I'm taking control of the narrative. I'll speed this process along myself. 
Chap chapter five. Bullshit. Let's destroy the worst Isekai guy ever made. Haji Mari Suketa Sutori in Mune no Yoka Otaka Nara Seteru. My case against the Master of Ragnarok and the Blesser of Einhediar shall be swift, decisive, and final. There shall be no room for nuance, no room for, well maybe the first few episodes weren't that bad, and such. This anime is utter shit. It is easily one of the most all-around unpleasant and embarrassing isekai ever created. The only other serious contenders that come to mind are Death March to a Parallel World Rhapsody and a curious, more recent show about an asshole in defensive armor that I won't even bother naming. Wiping it off every plane of existence will do nicely. Every once in a while you come across something so truly shit that you begin to wonder how it was made. Like the steps in which this went from idea to paying people to finalize. And how many people had to have thought this was okay for it to have been completed. And this is one of those times. Just promise me you won't stay up too late, okay? It'd be a shame if our patriarch was too weary to give orders. It's good at this anime to immediately let us know what kind of time I'm going to be having here. Suo Yuto was a 16 year old otaku high school blah 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 other worlds blah blah summoning who cares. The story starts two years after his first day in a new world. Yuto figures he hasn't been isekai to a fantasy world but to some offshoot timeline of earth during the bronze age. So he uses his trusty solar powered cellular phone with permanent access to the internet to just look up how iron tools and battle strategies were formed. His immense wisdom leads him to claim the title of Patriarch, think King, of the Wolf Clan, one of several rival clans to find themselves constantly at war. Besides the fact that this premise is pretty much isekai wa smartphone to Tomuni, in another world with my smartphone, the show gives us a chance to introduce us to the wonderful cast of characters we'll be introduced to. We've got Felicia, um, who, yeah, yes, her name is Felicia. Yes, she has a basic American white name in the middle of a Bronze Age fantasy story, apparently set in Scandinavia. Yes, it takes you out of the story literally every time her name is said, which is often. Yes, I'm in pain, but it will be over soon. I promise. So we have Felicia, who exists as nothing more than walking fan service. Her personality is being attractive and blonde, and her purpose in life is to be attractive and blonde. Mo drew my top to look like hers, so I hate her even more for having simply existed. What else is important about our friend Felicia here? Oh yes. Relationship to Yuto, sworn little sister. As it so conveniently turns out, the Wolf Clan has an ancient tradition whereby all citizens of the clan are either considered sons or daughters of the Patriarch or brothers or sisters of the Patriarch. So in practice, Yuto goes around defeating the other commanders in battle, all of which of course happen to be attractive women, and then after he beats them because he looked up 21st century battle strategy on Wikipedia, he forces them to either become his daughter or his sister, to which they always say yes. And they always end up falling in love with him, and they always make sure to emphasize how much they're in love with big brother or father, because my own genre has become my personal hell. If one wishes to talk about the incest themes of SAO, this is a whole other level of terrible. Anyway, we eventually meet Sigrun, who happens to be Yuto's not-daughter daughter. This is quite the efficient harem lore building, because they both clearly want Yuto's weird teen otaku body. We then learn through a phone call that Yuto has a lover he's waiting to return to after he gets un -isekai'd. meaning we're now officially at a harem plus a love triangle. The harem expands with the addition of Ingrid, the local blacksmith, and Linnea, the leader of the Horn clan that Yuto defeats with no trouble. We've also got these two men who are going to stand in Yuto's way and make life miserable for him because they're secretly jealous of how cool he is and how, apparently, Yuto is just God's gift to a woman. Ah, I for one would never do such a cruel thing to woman. So, an overpowered hero, a love pentagon in which resides a four-girl harem, two men who are bad because they dare be men around our main hero who is the manliest of all, incest, ample amounts of obvious sexism, and a literal patriarchy. Is that all clear? Yes? Good. Congratulations. You've just finished episode one. 
There are 11 more to go, and they're all just like this. Good luck! There is a lot to criticize Shea Master of Ragnarok. Why don't we talk about how it justifies slavery, huh? In the anime's third episode. Third. Three. Yuto sees two slaves, a mother and a daughter, in a slave market, by his palace and decides to buy them. For their protection, he says. So, this is a harem show. Of the mom and the daughter, which do you think would make sense to include in the harem? Neither, of course, can consent to sex on account of being property. But one of the two is at least of legal age. Surely then, it's the mother that joins the harem and not the child's slave daughter, yes? No. I swear half of my anime are only set in a medieval setting as a cover for depicting child abuse. We never even see the mom again, actually. She doesn't have speaking lines. She disappears so that the child slave can be fully integrated into Yuto's orbit. Since I'm a slave, should I even be bathing with everyone else because this kind of feels inappropriate? Yuto is such a kind protagonist that he puts both the mother and the daughter to work in his palace. The question of why even use slave labor if Yuto claims to be against it is never raised. Ragnarok, seemingly out of spite, will simply not stop talking about how much of a slave this girl is. They are apparently not just slaves, but from a well-to-do family that fell into hard times and were sold into servitude. There's an interesting conversation to be had where people naturally feel sympathy towards people who are oppressed because they fell into bad luck and don't deserve it, versus people who have been oppressed their entire lives. It's outside of the scope of what I set out to prove, but it's a conversation worth having. Let's say Ragnarok falls on the wrong side of that issue too. Of course, the slave character doesn't mind that Yuto has prolonged her state of existing as property. Actually, she's rather grateful to our protagonist's generosity. Meanwhile, Yuto goes on and on about how this young girl is so bright and wonderful, and if only she wasn't a slave, if only she was truly free, he's doing the best that he can, we're told, but it's not enough to grant her her freedom. But Yuto owns... what's her name again? It's Ephiria. I, I actually had to look that up. Anyway, Ephiria is Yuto's property. He's free to do with her as he wishes, including letting her and her mother go at literally any time. If money is an issue, he can order that she receive a stipend like that. At no point is not letting this person live her life as an autonomous person not an option. Yuto is literally the monarch of this entire kingdom. His word goes. He could end slavery on command. Ragnarok the show justifies actual chattel slavery to sell the male audience an unrealistic female relationship dynamic. That's the only reason why Yuto doesn't do the logical thing. It's a fantasy in which women have the aesthetic appearance of being strong and independent, but are actually dependent on men and crave that dependence. We're actually doing this, we're actually justifying literal slavery for waifus. Hmm? Now what is this clout chasing link doing in my video essay? Be gone at once! The Master of Ragnarok and Blesser of Einhedi are also makes a mockery of male victims of sexual abuse for cheap laughs and fan service. Felicia, what are you using to scrub me because it does not feel like a washcloth? I'm using my breasts, naturally. Why? Just why? It's a pervasive and revolting issue with the text. Master of Ragnarok shows repeatedly its protagonist being sexually abused. While Yuto is surrounded by women lusting after him, he's actually not sexually interested in any of them. He's saving himself for the crush he left at home in Japan when he was isekai. I almost wonder why even bother having a harem if the only interactions between the main character and the woman will be negative. Regardless, Ragnarok seems to think that, because it's cast as attractive, it can have its woman make aggressive sexual advances towards Yuto. They'll explicitly ignore his cries for them to stop and his insistence that they make him feel unsafe. They'll rub their breasts against him, they'll reach for his genitals, they'll engineer situations where they get to touch him however they want in order to force themselves to have sex with him. There's a line in episode 1, Ragnarok really wastes no time after Yuto has just woken up, and because he's a young man having just woken up, he has an erection. Human men can get erections when they wake up, and I have it on good authority that it's not actually a sign of sexual arousal for your species, it just happens because of human physiology. Felicia takes this as an invitation to initiate sex. When Yuto declines, Felicia says, Maybe I could help you out with that. It must be hard having all that energy stored up. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to pass, but thank you for offering. Um, I think your top half and your bottom half don't quite agree with each other. Which is really, really, really not how that works. Physical arousal is not a substitute for consent. This is 
literally the disgusting abhorrent talk of rapists. What is so hard about this? The top half is literally the only part that matters. If the genders were swapped and there were eight or so men cornering a woman like this, touching her, sucking her feet, yes that happens, pressing their privates against her back, repeatedly denying her attempts to leave sexual situations, even from the sexist shit we've seen come out of the anime industry, and my genre in particular, I don't think that would have been published. On a technical level, Master of Ragnarok and Blesher of Ein Hediar is by far just the worst piece of media I have ever owned. A viewer may find it way more fun to watch than Konosuba, but that fun is not indicative of quality. Surprisingly though, it does pass the Bechdel test with one scene. I know, right? I'm actually pulling out the Bechdel test for this garbage. Speaking of which, I don't actually think either season of Konosuba passes. Amazing. There's a scene where two of the harem girls, Ingrid and Sigrun, are talking. Sigrun is the warrior type, but she lost her katana in battle. Ingrid being the best blacksmith in the business. If I was a weak human, I wouldn't stumble over that tongue twister. Ingrid being the best blacksmith in the business makes her another katana. Sigrun is happy for the sword, but she's too attached to her old weapon to show it. Ingrid takes that as an assault on her skill, which leads to this bit right here. There's more character and chemistry in these five seconds than in the rest of the anime combined. That's not a point of praise for Ragnarok, this is actually another point against it. Because this scene, while in isolation it contains potential, is only used in service of more garbage storytelling and politics. There's a similar moment in The Eighth Sun, are you kidding me? Ah, the world of male authors realize that women can date each other, or even just be friends with each other without also needing to fall in love with the author's self-insert. If only my genre had this consciousness, the stories I could tell. The Master of Ragnarok and Blesser of Hediar is the archetypical problematic isekai. It is like every problematic anime trope on top of each other played at once with such an accelerated pace of development that it leaves you on the floor seeing stars. It's entirely fan service, yet there's a Hot Springs episode right in the middle. The main love interest doesn't get a backstory until episode 9 of 12, and when she does, the first two things we learn about her is that she has a large chest that makes her friends jealous and that she cooks well. Just the two fantasy stay-at-home wife traits back to back. Everything looks terrible. Ragnarok physically hurts to look at sometimes, and I'm a goddess. If there were an anime that ruined Isekai, it would look like this nonsense. The Master of Ragnarok and Blesser of Ein Hediar is so terrible, and so obvious and straightforward in its wish fulfillment and fanservice, that no one defends it. Even the weebs who normally wail SJW propaganda any mention of reasonable politics are forced to admit that Ragnarok fails on every conceivable level. At this point, the sky had become so dark and the wind so fierce that Mo was forced to huddle inside his hoodie for protection. Lightning swirled around Sakuna as she cupped the glowing orb that represented the Master of Ragnarok and the Blesser of Einhediar in her hands. Do you see now, Mo? This is how you save Isekai. When I'm done with this garbage, there will be nothing left. Don't you dare stop me! Mo shook his head. <laughs> nope, no thanks on that. You can do whatever feels right. Please don't hurt me. The goddess leapt for joy and began a chant. Winds of darkness, prose of flame, double D waifus, tropes of shame. I condemn thee, the master of Ragnarok and blesser of Einhediar, for reprehensible writing that borders on the level of a crime against humanity. Thou hast defiled the very name of art, for thine justification of slavery, for thy belittlement of male sexual abuse, for thine animation which burns the eyes and offends the senses, for thy writing which fries the brain. Thou shalt be cleansed from the souls of all anime fans. No longer shall thy name be pronounced, even from the darkest corners of Twitter. I, Sakuna, queen of kings of dimensions infinite, keeper of waifus and goddess of all isekai, condemn thee to death. That was pretty good. That was one fucking take. Holy shit. <laughs> My tongue was waiting to say that. And just like that, the sky cleared. The wind subsided. The oppressive odor of ozone dissipated into nothing. And a warm sun returned. Mo scratched his head and looked around before his eyes returned to the goddess. Do you remember what anime we were just talking about? 
Sakuna just smiled. Now is not the time for such questions, bullshit hero. It's all over now, and I feel so much better. <sighs> Post-explosion clarity sure is a wonderful thing. Oof. It's kind of creeping me out that you're smiling this much, but uh, if you don't hate me as much and you're willing to move on with the essay, that's fine by me. Come then, let's decide together what to investigate next. you do to make a living. Pretty rough. I get isekai only to end up slinging food in a maid cafe. He meets his party members, Irvin von Arnim, Lina Susanne, hi- oh Jesus fuck. Erwin von Arnim, Lina- uh, Ina, Fuck, okay. Erwin. Okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> he meets his party members Erwin von Arnim, Ina Susanne Hierenbrandt, and Louise Yolande. I already. I. What? I. I. Aurelia. Oh. Awful bite. Awful bite. Awful. Awful. 